DNA is absolutely fundamental to these alarmy, uh, Illuminati bloodlines that are obsessed with interbreeding and holding this DNA. Why? And we, we see in the Genesis the talk of um, the Nephilim um, uh, who, who interbred with the daughters of men and stuff like that. The, the sons of God who interbred with the daughters of men, which in the real translation says sons of the gods. And this common theme around the world in different cultures is if this interbreeding that produced this hybrid bloodline. And what happened to me was that in a period uh, starting in it like the, just after the mid-90s, um, I started meeting people uh, in all different walks of life, and I didn't go looking for it, who were telling me the same basic experience, that they had seen people, often in positions of power, but not always, who had moved from a <clears throat> human to a reptilian type form and then back again. Not always reptilian, but it's a real common theme. And um, th when you hear of one or two of these, you think, what? And then, and then you hear more and more and more, and unless you're in denial of following the information because you don't want to go there or you have a belief system to defend, then the information demands that you, you go there and follow it through. And I've now met hundreds of these people and had communications with um, many more who have told of this same basic theme, like from all different walks of life. And when I first wrote about this stuff in a book called The Biggest Secret, I'd already met Credo Mutwa, and we talked uh, the year before about various things, where he'd done most of the talking, actually, which is a good thing, because he has so much to say. Uh, but then when I went back to South Africa the following year, when The Biggest Secret had come out, he contacted me, and he said, how do you know this? How do you know about the Chittahuri? And I told him I just met people, and uh, sort of just accumulation of information. He said, the Chittahuri are a fundamental part of our culture and our history. And Chittahuri translates as the children of the serpent or the children of the python. And he told me about how uh, the story that I was talking about in The Biggest Secret was mirrored in the um, African knowledge that had been passed on through that secret society network that I talked about earlier in the day. And he showed me some artifacts um, including uh, this one. It's called the Necklace of the Mysteries. It's at least 500 years old, because it's mentioned 500 in, in, in accounts of 500 years ago. He says it's a, at least 1,000 years old. And it tells the story of, of, of Africa in symbols. And um, the storytellers, like Credo, who's the official storyteller, as well as the official historian of the Zulu nation, he talks about um, the history of Africa from these symbols. Now, <laughs> Right pride of place in the front is um, a figure that looks definitely not human. He doesn't look reptilian because um, he said that these Chittahuri said that if they were ever depicted as they really looked, then they, they would destroy anyone who did that. So what they did was symbolize the fact that they were non-human without uh, showing exactly what they looked like, although there are some... Um, ones that uh, do uh, look reptilian. And what you've got is this non-human entity with a big copper willy in come and get me mode. Now, fascinatingly, fascinatingly, he said the original one was golden and someone stole it and it was replaced by a copper one. Here we have the golden penis of Osiris. And this recurring theme in, in other parts of the ancient world mirrored in the southern African culture. And uh, the, um, the two figures, the uh, extraterrestrial and the non-human woman, uh, the human woman rather, fit together, shall we say. And what he said this is symbolic of is the interbreeding between the Chittahuri and humans to create this hybrid bloodline, this hybrid DNA. And this is the DNA they're interbreeding to try to hold. Because as we'll come to in the next uh, section, when I've just been through this uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes, um, the, the, the nature of DNA answers some real questions about what's going on in the world and the nature of life. So... Again, we have this <coughs> recurring theme of the interbreeding. Um, fascinatingly, again, this necklace of the mysteries is at least 500 years old, 
and on it is what we would call a flying saucer. It's very difficult to take photographs in the African sun, but the bottom there mirrors the top. It's the classic flying saucer hanging from the hand of this um, necklace of the mysteries, which was passed down through the shamanistic stream to Cradle. And he um, talks today still about the fact that African women are um, uh, abducted and um, uh, interbred with uh, these Chittahuri. And what happens is they, they start to be, they become pregnant and suddenly the baby disappears. And he said, this is such a common theme um, in Africa. And people come to him because they know that he won't laugh at them. And uh, it's uh, amazing what's going on um, behind the, the scenes. Also, what, what you find, it's like, you know when um, you've not noticed something and then someone says to you, hey, um, have you seen that new car? Oh, look, there's one. And you haven't noticed it before. And you say, oh, yeah, it's a new car. I haven't seen that before. Suddenly, you've seen that bloody car everywhere. It's like sub the subliminal has come into the conscious mind and then you start to see it. And in my experience, in the experience of many other people, once you start to take on this reptilian um, uh, uh, dimension of, of these things, suddenly you just see how much reptilian symbolism there is any, everywhere. Um, someone sent uh, me these pictures uh, from Scandinavia only uh, last week of um, statues in um, one of the uh, parks. And uh, the, 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 the man the park was named after, the, um, the email was saying, um, talked about the, the, the reptilians and how they were the, the demons who um, manipulated humanity. And this is a reptilian figure in a clinch with a human woman. There's another reptilian figure symbolically controlling a, a, a human. And um, you find these things in amazing abundance. There's a, a, an ancient uh, uh, depiction of the half-man, half-reptile uh, figure there everywhere you find it. And I've, somebody sent me this picture. Ooh! The eyes have it. And when um, I've met these people and they've talked about seeing this shape-shifting, a lot of them have seen the full body chef, but a lot of people see the eyes go. The eyes seem to go first. And wh when I started meeting all these people, <clears throat> I remembered that uh, I had read something in this book, uh, Transformation of America, by a lady called Kathy O'Brien, who was a mind-controlled slave of the American government, uh, who's written uh, an amazing uh, book um, detailing her experiences with people like Father George Bush and the brutality extraordinaire of Dick Cheney and all these people. And I remember, I'm sure she men mentioned reptilians in, 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 these, in this book. So I start flicking through the index, looking for reptilians, and at the time thinking, what am I on? What am I doing? And there's about four or five mentions in this book. She talks about being with Father George Bush, and um, he told her that they were an extraterrestrial race that had taken over the planet, but no one realized it because they looked human. And she said, I saw him shift, not his whole body, his face, from a human to a reptilian form and then back again. And uh, the uh, other thing that she mentions is that she was seconded at one point to a guy called uh, Miguel de la Madrid, who was president of Mexico. And she said that he told her the story of what he called the iguana race. And he said that um, an extraterrestrial reptilian race had um, interbred with humans because they needed a form through which they could um, operate in this planet without being exposed. And that these um, hybrids could take either human or reptilian form and could move between the two. And in his words, quoted in the book, perfect for world leaders. And what Kathy O'Brien does because, understandably, because, uh, you know, in the mind control uh, projects that she was um, involved with and a victim of, um, she says in, in the book that this whole reptilian thing that she kept coming across must have been part of the mind control to confuse her. But then you put what she experienced together with all these other people who have told of their experiences, and they mirror each other. Um, and this is um, something that uh, a therapist in Australia sent to me who works with people who've been involved in satanic ritual abuse and, um, again, in mind control. And he said um, that his um, clients, particularly uh, this one that he sent me the pictures from, 
um, depicted their abusers and their experiences in satanic ritual um, with, in reptilian form, with the people having reptilian eyes and reptilian symbolism. And he said, until I read your books, I didn't re- realize and understand what they were doing, but this now makes perfect sense to me. Um, these are some of the, uh, the drawings that this, uh, this lady made. Another thing that people see, psychic people who um, can see beyond the five senses, they talk to me about seeing people um, overshadowed, is the word they often use, by an ethereal reptilian form which connects into the um, physical human through these lower chakra points, these lower vortex points in the human energy field. And one of the ways that people are controlled and limited in their perception is by limiting the information available to them. If you have that amount of information, you are going to basically have that amount of a sense of possibility. And what um, uh, I could put forward as an example is um, the earth is round, the earth is flat. When people started saying the earth was a sphere, because people had that amount of information and understanding, they had that amount of a sense of possibility, and so they said, don't be ridiculous, you cannot have a round earth because the people on the bottom would fall off. Now, once you introduce the law of gravity, expansion of information, knowledge, you have an expansion of sense of possibility. Oh, I can see why the, how the earth can be a sphere now. <clears throat> because we are led to believe, we're going to get into this big time um, shortly, that the, this world is solid, our sense of possibility boom, contracts. Because if I was talking about a shapeshift between a solid human form and a solid reptilian form, that would be ridiculous. But I ain't talking about that because the body isn't solid. It's a holographic energy field and it's just an illusion. And the amount of um, reality, infinity, that we can actually perceive with human sight is so staggeringly tiny, as one writer quite rightly said, humans are basically blind. We are decoding into a physical reality a minute fraction of what even mainstream science says exists in this universe. And that's only what they say exists, not what actually exists. Um, The electromagnetic spectrum is um, apparently 0.005% of what is projected to exist in mass in this universe. Visible light, human sight, is a fraction of that 0.005%. And so just beyond our sight is infinity, but just beyond human sight is the realm it appears that this reptilian, these reptilian entities, not all that reptilian uh, expresses itself in a reptilian form is manipulating, I'm just talking about this particular force that keeps coming up, they operate just outside the um, frequency range of human sight. And when they move in, they appear out of nowhere, and when they move out, they disappear. They don't, they move in and out of the frequency that we can access. It's like people say, I saw this UFO and it disappeared in front of my eyes. And people say, what are you on, you daft bugger? No, it hasn't disappeared. It's entered your frequency range. Hey, there's a spaceship. It's left your frequency range. It's gone, look, it's gone. That's all that's happening. What, what, what we're dealing with is... Uh, like a radio station sharing the same space. All the radio stations broadcasting to Mount Shasta are sharing the same space here now. They're not interfering with each other unless they're really close on the dial because they're on different frequencies. We get a radio, we tune to one radio station, that's what we get, that's our reality. We move the dial, we're now on another station, that's a new reality. The reality we've just left, still broadcasting, it's just that we're not accessing anymore because we've moved frequency. Now. These reptilians apparently seem to have the ability to move in and out, uh, certainly within a certain range of frequencies, in of our, into our reality and out. 
And one uh, way of the manifestation of shape-shifting is they move into this reality. Did you see that? They move out. No, look, what's the matter? I can't see anything. And, 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 and so once we start to realize the nature of reality and the illusory nature of reality, a lot of things that seem crazy, bizarre, and impossible start to take on a different light. This is, um, I'm going to show a few pictures um, in this last section by a friend of mine, a wonderful artist called Neil Haig, um, which you can go to his website, neilhaig.com, see a lot more. And this interbreeding um, has created a vibrational frequency field, which we call DNA, which resonates with these reptilian entities, which allows them to possess control the human five sense level much more effectively than the other human population which is resonating in DNA terms in a less compatible frequency um, than these particular Illuminati hybrid bloodlines. And this is why they want to interbreed and hold this DNA because it is a frequency which allows connection to this reptilian uh, these reptilian entities uh, to uh, possess them. The DNA um, is a, like I say, it is a, I'll get into it more um, when I move into that section, but it is to do with frequency. We only uh, are aware of the physical level, but it's actually a frequency field. The other thing that you start to realize is just how much reptilian genetics we have. The ancient part, the oldest part of the human brain, according to science, is called the R complex, the reptilian brain. And from the reptilian brain, according to mainstream science, we get the characteristics of uh, ritualistic behavior, not just human sacrifice, but going to the supermarket at the same time every week. Very ritualistic recurring behavior. We get cold-blooded behavior, having no empathy um, with the victims of our behavior. We get the traits of might is right, this is mine, and also um, the desire for top-down hierarchical structures of power. Now, never mind the reptilian side of it, I have just described the Illuminati. I've just described the Illuminati families and their... This is one of the reasons why I've said a number of times today they are so predictable, because they're ritualistic, they repeat behavior, and it's a, um, a, a reptilian um, trait. You also, again, you find, you find it, this shape this is a child, children's book, which is about shape-shifting between human and uh, reptilian form. Um, and this is the Queen. I've definitely lost my knighthood now. <laughs> See, people laugh. They say, oh, this, this, was, this was on the front of a, ma of, of a magazine which was trying to take the mick out of me, which I don't mind because it's giving me a nice picture to symbolize what I'm saying. Thanks very much. Um, but what they say is it's mad reptilians. But when uh, well, the Queen is not reptile, look at her. Well, what you're seeing when you look at the, at the human level is the five sense level because you're looking at it with your five sense reality, your human sight within the visible frequency range of visible light. But just beyond that are entities that look anything but human. And you know, people say, oh no, we're reptilians, and we're kind of have intelligence. Well, when you think the fraction of infinity that we actually access with human sight and then look at the incredible diversity of form within that tiny frequency range. Imagine what exists in terms of diversity outside of that. It's all possibility. So, yeah, I mean, he's, uh, he's one, of the, uh, one of the bloodlines. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if they did that? Um, when he's being interviewed on telly, uh, uh, Mr. Cheney, can I have a word? Um, this is another Neil Haig uh, picture, and it's like they're being overshadowed, and, and their mental, emotional, uh, what the, the, there is of it emotionally, um, faculties are being controlled externally, possessed, and we're only seeing the human form, the human expression of it. So when you look into the eyes, beyond there, is something else. This is a picture uh, painted by Credo Mutwa. Very different, just behind the eyes. Just beyond there in frequency terms. And I've, I mentioned earlier that a guy called Ted Heath, who was a, a monumental child abuser, who's former um, Prime Minister of Britain between 70 and 74, he was the one that signed us into what became the European Union. Ooh. Well, 
before I was into any of this, um, I was just a spokesman for the British Green Party and I was a BBC presenter. I think it was 1989, it was, we had a, an election result with the Green Party in Britain, which was the only time they did any good. And I was invited onto this election program to discuss the results as they came in, because the polls showed that we were going to do very well. As I went in to have the powder put on as they do, um, I was just led in and said, somebody will be with you in a minute, moment. And I sat down in the chair and I looked to my right and there was Ted Heath, former Prime Minister of Britain. And, you know, he's well known, all that stuff. And I turned and I nodded, hello mate, how are you doing? And, as you do. And I'll never forget it. I went home to my family that night and I said, I've just had the most incredible experience with Ted Heath. What happened is, he was sitting there and when I said hello, he, he, there was a mirror and all the makeup room, he turned and he just looked at me. And he never did anything else. And he's, nothing, his head never moved, just his eyes. And his eyes started at the top of my head, went down to my feet, and then went b back again. And all I can describe it as, he was scanning me. And when I looked into his eyes, there was nothing there but blackness. There was no pupil, no white, the whole area of the eye was just black and I described it as like looking into a black hole. When I look into the eyes of someone, I'm making eye contact. With Ted Heath, it was like looking into um, another dimension. I now realize that's exactly what I was doing. And uh, this is, um, he was a wonderful example of this phenomenon. So, these bloodlines are what connect these apparently unconnected people. Now, some of these may not be, because there's a lot of pawns in the game, what they call mice who serve the dragon. Um, but this is just symbolic. Some of them definitely are. And when you look through the um, stories, through the ages, the, the reptilian thing, the dragon, I mean, the whole Chinese culture is based on the dragon, comes up. Messiah comes from Mesa, the um, fat of the... Nile crocodile that was part of the anointing process, Christ the anointed one in um, Egypt. Um, many depictions of what is known as the devil have a reptilian feel about them. And then you have all these fairy stories, and a lot of these fairy stories carry symbolic truths through the ages. There were ways of passing it on. And how many fairy stories are about frog princes and frog princesses interbreeding and all this stuff, and, and moving between a frog and a prince and stuff. Again, the royal bloodlines. Of the, um, of the ancient times were invariably from this. Then you've got the gargoyles that are on the cathedrals. This is Notre Dame in Paris, which is famous for them. And also the um, mansions and castles of the aristocracy, again, the elite bloodlines, have these um, gargoyle figures all over them. This is, again, the, uh, the coat of arms uh, of the Marlborough family. Many of these elite aristocratic families have reptilian symbolism in their uh, logos and their uh, coats of arms. The Marlborough family is an elite um, uh, aristocratic family in Britain, uh, an offshoot of which produced Winston Churchill. Um, in Babby London, as some of us call it, the centre of, um, of the Babylon um, uh, network in so many ways, um, the centre, I talked earlier about the City of London, the financial district where St Paul's Cathedral is, being one of the great heart centres of the Illuminati. Well, how appropriate that its coat of arms is two flying reptiles holding the shield of the Knights Templar. When you enter the City of London, which is the financial district within the great urban sprawl of London, um, and this is where the Knights Templar are and, and the, uh, the places where... Uh, Tony Blair was brought up as a lawyer and stuff like that. You, when you enter it, you pass the flying dragons on the road. Right at the point in London where the City of London Financial District meets Temple Bar, the centre of the global manipulation of law, and Temple Bar is named after the fact that the Knights Templar used to own that, that land and probably still do, um, you have a flying reptile in the middle of the road. This is um, just a throwaway. When uh, the British troops were training to uh, fight in Iraq, they gave them these reptile goggles. Goodness knows um, why, although maybe they're having a laugh. A friend of mine in Italy who's an, an astrophysicist called uh, Giolana Conforto, she's written a number of books about uh, the, the physics beyond the mainstream and this interdimensional physics. And she um, contacted me once and she, she said, talked about the interspace plane. She writes about them in, in her books. 
And she said, the interspace planes are like neutral zones between dimensions. And she said, they don't have a natural energy source. They're like a neutral zone. She says, I think that's where these reptiles are that you talk about. Um, and she said, Any, anything that operates, lives in these interspace planes, these neutral zones, will have to generate some source of energy for itself. So, I ran Kreda Mutwa, and I asked him if he had in his um, African culture anything that in any way corresponded to what she was talking about with interspace planes. Oh, yes, he said. We call them the heaven between heavens. And he said, that's where the Chittahuri are. Um, and this starts to make sense in terms of uh, many things. They need an energy source. And they've found one. Us. And so, with this <coughs> reptilian and, and other entities that don't take a reptilian form, but the reptilian form is so common, so recurring, they are operating from another dimension, and it's another level of this one force controlling other forces that appear to be unconnected. And one of the things they do in satanic ritual is they create the energy environment in the ritual that allows these entities to manifest. And they also make sacrifice to these entities who feed off the fear of the victim. Now, when we go back into the stories of the past, we talk about uh, or read about how sacrifices were made to the gods, how virgins were sacrificed to the gods, like the Aztecs who uh, sacrificed inf thousands to the gods. You start to realize that what these gods were and what the sacrifice actually did, it produced the energy of terror and fear that was absorbed by these people because we are an energy source for them and the energy source is human fear and all its expressions like guilt, like stress, like frustration, it gives off a vibration which they absorb. And so behind these world leaders, is this reptilian source, this reptilian force operating from these interspace planes. Uh, the Illuminati, symbolized by Neil Haig here in that figure, um, they are the front, what we see in human form, but they're controlled by another force. And so the way it's set up is that you have at the top of these different countries and different organizations, people who are possessed by these reptilian entities. And they sit on top of these pyramids of humanity. Like I, we were saying in the last section, the people who um, declare the wars and manipulate the wars do not fight them. The human population fight them. They sit on top of the political system, the financial system, the media system, the military, religion, royalty, and from the peak of these pyramids, they manipulate humanity to create the energy that they absorb. The more stress that they generate, the more wars and suffering that they generate, the more energy they absorb. It gives them power, which they then recycle back against us. And just... I was with my son a few years ago. This was a Disney movie. I nearly fell off my seat. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Monsters, Inc. Either the writer got bloody lucky or he knows what's going on. Because the story was that they had this monster world which did not have an energy source. And the human world was where they got their energy. And the energy they got was human fear. So the power station in the monster world consisted of a thousands and thousands of different doors, house doors, bedroom doors. And they would come down and lock into position and these people who work for the monster um, world uh, um, energy uh, plant would then walk through these doors every day and on the other side was a child's bedroom. And the, the, their, their job was to frighten the child the child would scream, they would catch the scream in like a, 
a tube go back into the monster world through the door and that would power the monster world. It was powered by human fear. That is precisely, it seems, um, what happens on one level of this. There are many levels. I'm going to go to another level soon. Interestingly, the hero of Monsters, Inc. was the, the eye, the all-seeing eye. They're nothing if not a laugh. And, of course, in the Matrix movies, you had this story of uh, how the machines that were controlling the Matrix, the illusory world that was controlling humanity because they thought it was real, they were feeding and getting their power from human um, energy sources. And what did the Morpheus character say? He held up a battery and said, they've turned the human race into one of these. And that would seem, on this level we're talking about now, what is actually going on. When you look at the work um, that's been done with water crystals, where they have exposed water to certain states of emotion and words and what have you, and then frozen it and photographed it, to see what the crystals look like um, in response to the words and whatever, it gives you an understanding of the kind of difference in, uh, we have in the energy that's generated by different states of being. On the left is a crystal that was produced after the water had been exposed to words of love and affection. It is balanced, it is harmonious, it is beautiful. On the right is water um, that has been exposed to words akin to, I hate you, I'll kill you. And they represent different vibrational states. One harmonious and balanced, one totally chaotic. And that's the energy that they manipulate this world to produce because it is their energy source, their source of power. The more hate, stress, war, conflict, the better it is for them. They don't want harmony and love. It's the last thing they want because um, of the effect for them in terms of an energy source. On the right there is what um, mobile phone frequencies do to the water um, compared with what love does to the water. Ooh-wee. What do chemicals in food do? So you have this situation and the people are played off against each other to create this energy source. And what is beginning to happen, this is another Neil Haig picture, is that we are beginning to awaken and go beyond this vibrational prison that's been uh, created to hold us in five sense reality. They are doing everything they can to hold us in five sense reality because that can be manipulated to create chaos and war and disharmony when when you go beyond that, you enter the silence of all that is, then you stop producing the energy that is their source. Harmony is what they don't want. So, that's one level of it. One reason why they create all this harmony and disharmony and fear. But then there's another level, again, which starts to make more sense of what happens in the world. Level three, which is, it's all a bloody illusion, which we are creating by our belief in what is real. Seeing is believing, no, believing is seeing. What is reality? Reality is whatever we believe it to be. One of the key things that the people at the top of the pyramid understand beyond the bushes and the blares and all that stuff, the people you never see, is they understand the process of how we create reality. And they are manipulating us, and getting to this in detail now, to create the reality that suits them by externally implanting a belief in what is real, therefore through the process I'll explain, uh, getting us to manifest the reality that suits them. It's all an illusion. I, 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 I realized for quite a long time that it's all an illusion, but it's easy saying it and all that stuff, but then kind of understanding how it all works is not so easy, but I've, I've traveled with that. 
And we, we, we realize, even on a kind of scientific level, that there are things beyond the physical, that we, are, we have an energy field, that we have a, a magnetic energy field, and there are other levels of us. You know, sometimes, the, in some ways, these can be photographed. The different emotional states uh, produce different colors in the aura, the, the, um, the energy field, because every vibration represents a color or a shade of color, and as our emotions change, the color that those emotions represent change, therefore our colors in our aura change. It's real simple. Um, and we can photograph through things like Curlian photography the, the human energy field and the energy field of living things. However, it's far bigger than that. It's not just about we have other levels and that's it. It's all an illusion. And it's an illusion that we can enjoy or it's an illusion that can control us. One of the big things that happened to me in recent years was when I wrote um, Alice in Wonderland in the World Trade Center disaster, when I finished that, I, 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 said, I, said, to, I said to my wife, I said, you know, if I'm going to go further with this, because I don't want to go in a holding pattern, uh, just at one level of this, I want to I wanna know. And where it takes me, it takes me, but I want to know. And so I said, I've got to go into these other levels in awareness, not in some dream, was that, what was that a dream? What I don't but in awareness. And symbolically, or not symbolically, coincidentally or synchronistically, more better term, around that time I was invited to go to Brazil and partake of something called ayahuasca, which is a rainforest plant which shaman in South America have been uh, using to take people into other states of consciousness for uh, centuries. You can have a bad experience on it, you can have a good experience on it. Mine was unbelievable. I took it, I could have taken it four times while I was there, I took it twice, enough for me, not done anything like that since, it was an experience, I want to go there without it, because we can. But over two nights, especially the second one, I had this extraordinary experience, where I went into another uh, state of consciousness, and a, a female voice, it was the form it took, but of course it was a transfer of thought consciousness, um, which I decoded as a female voice and decoded um, into, human, into English language, but really it was just a transfer of thought. And for five hours, this voice talked to me in great detail about the nature of reality and the fact that it was an illusion. And what it said was that our natural state is one of oneness, where we are all that exists, there is no me, we, there is just one infinite I, one infinite isness which we are all um, not part of, we are all it. But what has happened is that we have forgotten that we are the dream and the dreamer, and the dream has taken over, and the dream has led us to believe that we are a part, we think in terms of parts, not whole. We think in terms of David Icke, not infinite consciousness. And therefore, we've got caught in an illusory trap of division. And symbolized by this um, picture. Um, it talked about, um, think of an eddy or whirlpool in a river. It's part of the river, but it's in a different state of reality. It's not flowing with the river, it's in its own little world. And as it said, as long as the circumstances remain the same, that eddy will just keep going round and round and round and round. Only when the circumstances change, the flow changes, will it become flowing back into the river again and become the oneness. And when it started, this voice started talking to me, it opened up by saying, there's only one thing you really need to know. Infinite love is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. And I, in my mind, I went to say everything, and I got halfway through, it said, everything else is illusion. Because what it was saying was, the only truth is the existence of this infinite one consciousness which is all loving, all knowing, all wise, the 
harmonious amalgamation of all. Everything else is the imagination of that consciousness made manifest, illusion. We have a dream and we wake up and we say, oh, I had this amazing dream. Well, the only difference between that and this is we believe this dream is real. And of course, in the dreams, when we fall off the edge of cliffs, we just wake up, we're all right. We don't get splattered on the rocks because it's just a dream. But we do here because we believe in the limitations of this dream and therefore we experience the limitations of this dream. And now we're getting really into it because what the Illuminati are trying to do is manipulate the dream and our reality and sense of the reality of the dream. Uh, Einstein said, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. Now, where is the persistent one? I'll come to that. But even in terms of uh, the science now, although they don't talk about this in the schools and stuff, like in colleges, they just ignore it because, oh my goodness me, we don't want to talk about that because all this is a load of bollocks, if that's all right. So we, we want to protect this and so we'll keep that our way. We look at this world and we think it's solid. It seems solid. It can't be. Uh, even science says... The world is made up of atoms. Atoms are, in this reality, empty. As someone once uh, said, a writer said, if you take um, an atom to be the size of a cathedral, the nucleus is about the size of a ten cent piece. And that's what this is made up of. But it gets more, it gets more amazing because when you go into the electrons and you go into the nucleus and you go into all these things, they're bloody empty as well. It's all an illusion manifested in our minds, which we then take to be real and so we experience it. On the level of the brain and the body, the only place this world exists is in here. What was that the Morpheus character said? If what is real, if you're talking about what we can see, touch, hear, taste, smell, Real is just electrical signals interpreted by your brain, exactly. The senses send electrical messages to the brain. The brain decodes them into holographic reality that only exists in here. There is no out there. What is out there is just frequency uh, fields that are, we are constantly decoding. And we're decoding some of them on levels that we're not even aware of. We receive 400 billion pieces of information a second. We are aware of about 2,000, which is what we take to be our reality. So the brain is decoding the senses into a holographic um, reality and it only exists in our heads. This is a brilliant book by Michael Talbot. Now, he talks about the holographic universe. Everything is a hologram. I'm going to get to that. And holograms, of course, are illusions. They may look solid, the best of them that we make in the human realm, but you can put your hand through them because they're just a projection, an illusion. And he tells a wonderful story in there which really encapsulates what I'm saying. He talks about um, uh, his father having a party and a stage hypnotist coming along and um, doing his party tricks. And he got this guy, I think his name was Tom, and he sat him down and he got him, to, I think, to eat a, an apple, thinking it was a potato, thinking it was an apple. Now, how does he do that? He implants a belief in reality into the person's consciousness, mind, to believe that he's eating a apple when he's eating a potato. So what the brain does on the basis of that belief is decode the electrical signals from potato to apple, in effect. And he believes that he's eaten an apple. This is what stage hypnotists are doing. They're implanting a reality. Anyway, in this uh, story that Michael Talbot tells, the, the, the hypnotist said to this Tom guy, when I bring you back to a waking state, you're not going to be able to see your daughter. And what he did then was led his daughter to stand in front of this guy, so he's, he's looking at his daughter's belly. And so he wakes up, or apparently, and he says to Tom, um, can you see your daughter? Guy looks around, no, she's not here. Um, he goes behind the daughter and puts his hand at the small of her back, Tom on the other side, and says, I'm holding something, Tom. What is it? He says, it's a watch. Holding a watch. 
He says an inscription on it. Can you read it? He read the inscription on the watch. Between the watch and Tom was his daughter. That's fantastic. Impossible. No, because reality, in, in, in terms of a physical reality, only exists in our heads. And therefore, if we, if through our belief, we remove something from that reality, we simply do not decode that energy field, and therefore we do not see it. I said to Crater Mutwa, is that before I read Talbot's book and, and looked into this, I said, Crater Mutwa, if these, all these reptilian uh, figures are around, why don't we more people see them? He said, because they are so fantastic compared with what people think is possible and real, that the brain just doesn't see them. They have, we have a blind spot, he said, just cuts them out. Absolutely what we do. Um, and that's why some people see ghosts and some people don't, or one reason why. Now, what, what we do uh, in this human realm, or this reality, when we make holograms, we use lasers, and quite simply what we do is we take a laser, and we cut it into basically two parts. One part goes directly onto a photographic film, um, and the other one is diverted across the image we want to photograph and then diverted back onto the photographic film where it, it collides with um, the other part of the, uh, the laser. And what it does is it creates what they call an interference pattern. This is um, a very much akin to dropping two stones in a pond and the, uh, the waves come and collide with each other and that is a wave representation of those stones, how big they, they were, where they were dropped, how fast they were dropped and all that stuff. And what, what are we looking at? We're looking at a wave form, literally, a wave form of energy that represents something. When you look at the interference pattern on a holographic print, it looks interesting, like a human fingerprint in many ways, um, um, and I don't think that's an accident, uh, but we see an apparently incomprehensible series of lines. It's a frequency pattern, that's what it is. When you fire a laser onto that frequency pattern, suddenly we see three-dimensional images that we call holograms. They are illusory projections which we can put our hands through, but as you can see, they can look incredibly solid. These are all holograms. They appear solid, most of them, but they're not. That's the real uh, moon. There's no such a thing as a real moon. Uh, again, it's just a hologram that we decode, like the sun and the scenes that we see are holograms that we decode. The earth is a hologram that we decode. It is. I mean, I was I was lying on this, um, I was lying on this, uh, this this like mattress while I'm in this ayahuasca state, and this voice is talking to me for hours and hours, and just as loud as my voice is now, it's incredible. I said at one point, do you think that's the earth you're lying on now? <laughs> illusion. You are lying on the earth because that's what you believe you're doing. It's all illusion. It's all frequency fields that we decode into holographic reality. These are holograms. And when you think these are holograms made by human technology, imagine the holograms that the fantastic human brain and stuff can create. Uh, we see these three-dimensional images that can be projected on computers now. And we are uh, creating um, reality by decoding these frequency patterns into holographic images. So the reality is frequency patterns. We decode it into buildings and stuff like that. Um, in... Um, the holographic universe, Michael Talbot talks about a guy called Carl Pribham, who is a uh, neurophysiologist at Stanford University. And uh, this is where the cutting edge of science is going now, um, and uh, the rest of it's going to have to catch up. Um, Talbot, writing about Pribham, he says, Pribham realized that the objective world does not exist, at least not in the way we're accustomed to believing. What is out there is a vast ocean of waves and frequencies, and reality looks concrete to us only because our brains are able to take this holographic blur and convert it into sticks and stones and other familiar objects that make up our world. In other words, the smoothness of a piece of fine china and the feel of beach sand beneath our feet are really just elaborate versions of the phantom limb syndrome. You know, when people um, uh, have li limbs removed but can still feel them and uh, uh, they feel as if they're still there. So science is talking about this now. This is another Neil Haig picture. Um, 
This reality exists only in our heads as we decode these frequencies. Um, I got this one off the internet, another one, very symbolic. Uh, basically, it's like a, a virtual reality game that we are um, involved in. And when you think about it, what, what, what we are basically looking at is we are living in the holographic version of the internet. And the internet, as we perceive the internet, only exists in one place, on the computer screen. Everywhere else, it is mathematical codes and electronic um, signals and circuits. When we think of the internet, it's just on the computer screen. With television, the only place it exists as we perceive television is on the screen. You know, episodes of Friends and the 10 o'clock news don't come streaming over the trees. They come as a frequency pattern and the set decodes them. This guy, Jean Fourier, um, developed something called Fourier transforms, as they became known, which not only uh, was uh, fundamental in uh, allowing television to happen, it was also fundamental in the development of um, holograms. What, um, what happened to me in, uh, this was last September now, is a friend of mine came um, over, he's a healer, a guy called Mike La uh, Lambert, great healer, cutting edge. And we were chatting away, I hadn't seen him for ages. And we were chatting away, and for some reason DNA came up. And he told me about a paper he'd written about DNA a long time ago, which was really beyond the cutting edge at the time. Um, and, and, and is now, science is catching up. And he said two things to me which made my head go bang. One, every single um, life form, a, a D, a expression of DNA, it consists of the same four codes, A, C, G, and T. And the difference between a house mouse and a human is how those codes are sequenced. The other thing he said was DNA is a crystalline substance and it is a um, receiver, transmitter of information. And when he said that, I said, my God, that's it. That's how we're connected to the matrix. That's how we're connected to this collective reality. Because the question was, okay, yes, we, we create our own reality, fine. But how come then, if we create our own reality, how come that we all see the same stage and the same two bottles down there, the same microphone? How come if we're creating our own reality, there must be something that relates to a collective reality as well, which we then put our unique spin on? And when he talked about DNA and this receiver transmitter, I could see it immediately. We are like computer terminals on the physical holographic level. When you log on to the internet in China or America or London or wherever, you're logging into the same collective reality. Uh, we might then say, I like that website, I think that website's rubbish, we put that unique spin on it, but we're tuning into the same collective reality, the same internet. And what we are living in, in this reality, in this matrix, is a holographic version of the internet for the computer screen read brain on this level of reality that we're talking about. That is um, a D one DNA sequence um, of A, C, G, and T. And I, when I saw that, it reminded me of that. <laughs> now, what in the Matrix movie, what they were doing was looking at computer screens, which had all these codes on, but what they were seeing in the movie was street scenes and people and cars and all this stuff. And that's what we're doing. On one level of this, it's mathematics. It's a mathematical construct that we're involved in here. This is a uh, picture or a, uh, a, a, an image which was taken from a picture of a experiment that was done at the Necker Hospital in Paris where they injected a tracer substance into the human acupuncture points and then photographed where it went. And what it did was produce this. And the moment I saw this, I thought, that is a circuit board. And what this is, 
is a biological computer. And when I finished the last book, um, Infinite Love is the Only Truth, um, um, and it went off to be put into a book form, I came across this article where Russian scientists had got together with geneticists and linguists and other bloody different disciplines to try to understand what this 90-odd percent of DNA, which science calls junk DNA, because you don't know what it does, actually does. I mean, people have this image. Again, it's image. Oh, yes, science understands. It knows bugger all about DNA. I mean, how can you call 90-odd percent of DNA junk? I mean, was God having a laugh or what? What's going on? Ah, oh, confuse them, all that stuff, just rubbish, junk. But there's only that bit matters, you know. And um, it's ridiculous. And what these people came up with after this research study was that this human body is like a biological internet. And you know what's interesting? They have found that the slower the energy moves around the meridian lines of the circuit board, the more ill and less healthy we become. Why? Because the information passing around the computer is not fast enough to, re to create optimum health efficiency. What happens when you get, oh God, I should talk about this this week. What happens when you get a virus in your computer? One of the things it does is slow it down because the information starts to pass more slowly. And what happens is as the, uh, the virus gets more and more hold, um, the more and more things go wrong with the computer and eventually a real bad virus, you can't turn the computer on anymore. And what do we say? The computer's dead. What cancer is, is like a computer virus. And we have, um, in the computer uh, world, we have things like Norton antivirus to stop the viruses killing the computer. And we have a Norton antivirus, it's called the human immune system. And while the human immune system is working optimally, we do not get ill. When it's not working optimally, and so many of the things that are thrown at us in food and water and electromagnetic pollution are designed to disrupt the, uh, uh, the human immune system, it becomes overwhelmed and we start to get ill and, and all that stuff. And so we have got confused between who we are infinite consciousness, the silence between the thoughts that these try, buggers try to stop us accessing and we've confused who we are with the biological computer we are experiencing this reality through. And they're even developing in research projects around the world biological computers now that have the ability to think for themselves on some level. So we're like the internet we're um, logged in and we are decoding a collective reality through this system. Um, and what we decode and how we decode it depends on our belief in reality to a fundamental extent. Another interesting thing about holograms, which kind of can, you can project a bit more on how this matrix op actually operates, purely on the, the way the holograms operate, is that every part of a hologram contains a smaller version of the whole. And if we are a hologram, and parts of our body are smaller versions of the whole, which I'll get to in a second, then if you take on another level, and a higher level, and a higher level, eventually you get a super hologram, the matrix, which encompasses all within it. And because every part of the hologram is a smaller version of the whole, the super hologram must in some way relate to this hologram in the way it works. Like there is a central point which is decoding and sending out information, just like our DNA does. And my feeling is what we call evolution, the way things change over a period of time and where animals change their environment and their, their, uh, they change as a result, is not only is information coming to us, which we're decoding from the super hologram, we are sending information back, which is affecting the super hologram and how it manifests the whole. We call that evolution on this physical level. 
And um, also, we are communicating between each other also. This uh, process of the hundredth monkey syndrome, where they found that once a certain number of a species is taught something new, suddenly many of that species um, can suddenly do it without being shown, doing it spontaneously, seems to be a mystery, but it's not. The DNA coding, the sequence of ACG and T, is unique between species. And it's like having radio antennae that are tuned to a certain frequency. This is why species can communicate between each other so effectively. And so what happens with the 100th monkey syndrome is once a certain number of the species has learned something new, it has put that knowledge through this uh, process of communication, DNA, through the, the frequency, um, into the internet of that species and therefore other members of the species can access that knowledge without being shown and that is how, why they spontaneously are able to do something without being shown. Once the pioneers, if you like, have put that information. Now what is happening now is the pioneers of this information have started to put it into the human internet and it's now starting to be accessed without people having to learn about it. They instinctively know it and it is the hundredth monkey syndrome and it's that process which is going to bring the house of cards down because you can't stop that These are interesting little figures I mean these are approximate figures but basically 95% or something like that of DNA, science calls junk because don't know what it does. 90 odd percent and more of what is known to exist in the universe, we do not uh, access with our conscious minds and sight. 95 percent of brain activity does not relate to the waking state. I think I've seen an elephant in the living room here. Those figures are connected. We, on, on other levels of DNA, are connecting into these uh, um, unseen realms and <clears throat> decoding and accessing other levels of, 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 um, of the matrix. And what the Illuminati are trying to do is hold us in this fraction of DNA awareness that holds us in the five sense reality. And beyond five sense reality is endless worlds, which things like ayahuasca take you into by taking you out of the DNA prison. And therefore, what the human body is, is a hologram, and it can be broken down into, on one level, mathematics, which I'll come to in a second. Now, like I say, um, every part of the hologram contains the whole. And now we can start to understand how alternative healing works. The reason reflexologists can find uh, the body in the foot or the hand is because it has to be that way because the body's a hologram. If you couldn't find the representation of the hole in the hand or the foot or whatever, it wouldn't be a hologram. So you find um, uh, people find a representation of the body in the ear and all parts of the body. Of course, it's a hologram. It must be that way. That's how it works. Um, and uh, we are connecting into all these different levels, like I say. So what is reality? Whatever we believe it is, and also whatever we can be made to believe it is. So, when I, saw this, I saw this saying, where there is love, there is pain. Balls. <laughs> Only if you believe it. Only if you believe it. So, there is no spoon. Literally, there is no spoon. It is not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself. Exactly. How can there be a spoon out there when it's a, just a massive frequency field? These things, they're like miracles. What are miracles? And, and walking through fire without getting burned. If you walk for a fire believing you're going to get burned, you'll get burned. It's your reality. But how can an illusion burn an illusion? Only if you think it can. If you go into another sense of reality, you are not affected by that. And what we call miracles are merely um, going beyond the sense of limitation in this reality. 
We are all possibility. We only get limited if we believe in limitation. And like I say, we can bring this down on one level to mathematics with the, the DNA coding and stuff. And this is why you find these recurring mathematical sequences that many researchers come up with. Uh, numerology, um, uh, golden mean, uh, the Fibonacci number sequence where you add the last two numbers to get the next one, which is found throughout nature. It's because it's part of a mathematical construct on one level, um, which we are uh, decoding, just like the matrix. And there are certain points, and I would suggest strongly Mount Shasta is one of them, um, there are certain points on this construct which are particularly powerful places to affect the whole and also to access very, very powerful energy. And the ancients and people today, too, who understand this, that's why they put their stone circles when they did, where they did. That's where they hold certain places are sacred, as they do. It's because it's a holographic uh, expression of a key place in the mathematical construct. Um, again, this guy Fibonacci came up with this number sequence. And the human face and, and nature is constantly recurring this same sequence because it's uh, part of this mathematical construct. And uh, this guy, uh, Stephen Marquardt, an American doctor who studied um, the Fibonacci sequence in terms of the human uh, face, said all life is biology, all biolog biology is physiology, all physiology is chemistry, all chemistry is physics, and all physics is math, or maths as we say in England. And he might have added, all maths is energy, and all energy is consciousness, to complete the sequence. So, um, change. We are a biological computer on this level. The question is, is the computer going to run the show, the program, the software, or is infinite consciousness going to run the computer? And that's the question. What... What the Illuminati want us to do is let the computer run. And, um, and I would suggest that what we call thoughts and emotions, on the level that we perceive emotion, um, they are part of the software. They are uh, part of the program. See, it's interesting when um, therapists and psychologists, Carl Jung and others, they talk about being able to break down human personality into 12 or so archetypes and combinations of those archetypes. Well, how can they do that when we are infinite consciousness, infinite possibility? How can they do that? Because they are not measuring the infinite, the silence between the thoughts. They are measuring the computer program, which we call human personalities. What we call human is a program. And if we do not introduce infinite consciousness, because everything's consciousness, I'm making the point about infinite consciousness beyond the program. If we do not infuse that, then the program will run. And the behavior will be incredibly predictable and the reactions will be predictable and will go on uh, creating the same reality by doing the same things and believing the same things. As someone once said, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Why? Because you, you do the same things, you create the same reality, the eddy and the whirlpool keep going because circumstances don't change. And my feeling is, my feeling is that there are many people on this planet who actually are not connected to infinite consciousness on such a level that basically the computer is all that is running the show. And I would suggest, the more I understand and research this, that the Illuminati bloodlines are one like, fantastic example of this. And that's one reason why they're so incredibly predictable um, and also why they do not have empathy. That voice in Brazil said to me about the Illuminati and stuff, if you programmed a computer to abuse a child, would it have any emotional problem with doing so? No, it would just follow the instructions, the program, and that's what's happening. And I've symbolized it in the new book as a carousel. Some of the horses are going round with riders on, consciousness symbolically, infinite consciousness expressing itself, and others are going round without riders, but they're still going round. 
um, and some um, um, don't have riders. And there are three types of people in the world, it seems to me. Of course, this is a, 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 a kind of bringing it down to a simple level. There are those that are just the computer program, the biological computer playing out. They are the Illuminati bloodlines, and there are also many other expressions of humanity. Um, the second lot, the second group, probably by far the biggest, are those that are connected to uh, consciousness. My definition of consciousness beyond the matrix, but the program has so controlled their sense of reality that basically the, the, the horse is riding the rider not the other way around. And the consciousness is, is sitting at the back of the bus while the program uh, uh, drives the wheel. Um, and then there are the others, and they're becoming more and more all the time, who are opening to infinite consciousness, bringing it into this reality, and they are changing their sense of reality, but also chasing, changing the sense of collective reality by putting new information and new understanding into the Matrix. So in the, in the Matrix movie... In the Matrix movie, we had the woman in the red dress who looked in just like anyone else, but in the movie uh, was actually just a computer program. Um, and, of course, the agents were computer programs. And um, I would suggest... <laughs> this is why in the new book I call the Illuminati the red dress bloodlines. They are computer programs, and, and this is why they do not respond to empathy, they do not respond to, to, to situations, they just keep going on. And this is going to be the, the great downfall, because they can't do anything else but keep playing out the same thing. I would say this reptilian level is exactly the same. The reptilian genetics, like I, I explained with the reptilian uh, part of the brain, is extremely computer-like. In, in, incredibly uh, computer-like. And that's what we're dealing with. And once we introduce consciousness, game over. Uh, and like I say, there, I think there are many uh, people who are clones of the system. You know the people who, um, rules is rules, mate. They have no um, vision <laughs> um, beyond that. You know, a lot of them turn up as car park attendants and traffic cops and people like that, you know what I mean? And um, there, there's not uh, the, the ability to... To, to assess a situation and deal with it on the basis of the situation. Oh, no, mate, rules is rules. This is what we have to do. Computers. So, what is reality? Whatever it can, we can be programmed to believe it is. Now we're getting into the real heart of the manipulation with this understanding of how it all works. First of all, the God program. The God program is there to infuse a belief in reality that holds us in a tiny sense of possibility and gives our power away to deities and Jesuses and Mohammeds and Abrams and all this bloody stuff. Basically, it's the same program. And then we come to the information, the media and all this stuff, right? What is a stage hypnotist doing? He is implanting a belief in reality and we, the, the person, the subject, the stooge on the stage then decodes reality on the basis of that belief. Oh, there's an elephant in the audience. The person next to me is naked. Oh, God, I don't want to look. And all this stuff. We've seen all this. What is happening with the media and the education system and this explosion of information on the news and everything and through the box in the corner is collectively, especially that, is a mass hypnotist. That's what they're doing. They are hypnotizing us by implanting a false reality so we decode it into a false expression of sense of reality, just like a stooge on a stage with a stage hypnotist. And they know at the heart behind the people you see exactly what they are doing. And when we stop accepting external implanted senses of reality and start to decode our own uniqueness, not from here, but from here, symbolically, the silence, the infinite, then we will start seeing through the manipulation and seeing through this world because we will be in this world but no longer of it in terms of our perception. Wait, 
what they want to do, this is the game, is to isolate us in that eggshell I showed right at the start, symbolically in the five senses, because they control the five sense flow of information through the eyes and the ears, which implant a sense of reality. Once we get out there into the infinite, which we're already there, we've just forgotten, we've never been away, we cannot be, we're always one, then we'll start decoding um, this reality in a different way, which will be seriously at odds with the agenda. This is why they're hammering in the food additives and the electromagnetic pollution and the fear, because nothing locks you into five senses more than fear. It's a low vibrational emotion, the most low vibrational uh, sense of being, and that's why, uh, another level of reason why they generate fear. Um, this is um, a subliminal advertisement. Anyone who's read, um, or not a subliminal advertisement, a subliminal example, um, anyone who's read um, Tales from the Time Loop will, will have seen this and know what it says, but about 95% of people do not see it, and yet when you see it, it's deadly bloody obvious, and, um, and when you... Uh, when you don't see it, it's not obvious at all. For those who um, have not yet seen it, look at the white bits between the plants and you'll see S, E, X. And when you see that again, and I'll show you it shortly, you will not be able to see anything but S, E, X. Why? Because that which is subliminal, subliminal means be, below threshold, below threshold of conscious awareness, enters the conscious mind, then you suss it and you'll never get done again. This is the same sequence that happens with, have you seen that car, that new car, oh, there's one. Um, from the below threshold into the conscious mind, you keep seeing that car. This is why once people have realized the techniques of manipulation like problem, reaction, solution and all that stuff, what it's doing is bringing the subliminal into the conscious mind and suddenly, oh, I can see that, that's not true, that's problem, reaction, solution, isn't it? Uh, and this is what this information is doing. And all the time we are being implanted with this false reality, what they do is they implant it. These are just simple examples, but they do it on, on, on the scale through uh, the media and everything. They implant um, into the subconscious mind, below threshold, information, implanted belief, and then it filters to the conscious mind, and we take it to be our own thought. If anyone hasn't seen um, the subliminal here, this is it here, look. It's a willy. And what, they, what advertisers do is they use sexual subliminals because... Um, one of the things it does, for, for, for various reasons I won't go into, it attracts the conscious mind um, because we do have problems with sexuality and all that stuff. And what happens is the conscious mind focuses on it without realizing why it's focusing on it. The subconscious is actually pulling it in. They use a lot of sexual subliminals like that. There's a, an eight, a, 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 this is not so good. Now, this is, this is funny. This is an actual McDonald's advert for chicken McNuggets, <laughs> right? Now, I've seen a lot of chickens in my time, but I, uh, I've got to tell you, what, what, um, when, when the, the, they went to them and said, what's this advert? It looks like, you know, they said, oh no, we're a family company. We won't um, um, do that. Uh, no, of course you wouldn't. That's a chicken McNugget. They are, they're done to attract, but they just went over the top there and it went not below threshold, but into the conscious reality. You'll notice though that, that one of the Bush adverts, uh, I think it was in his first election campaign against Al Gore, what they did um, was they put rats up on the screen while they were uh, doing a, an anti-Gore advertisement and um, they left it up too long. So you only had to play the tape back slightly slower and there was rats. Um, uh, but what this is happening all the time, uh, uh, much more effectively done, so you don't actually see it. Um, Wilson Brian Key, who's uh, written some brilliant books on subliminal advertisements, he points out when they were doing anti-Gaddafi stuff, um, the time of Reagan and what have you, um, and Time magazine uh, put this picture on the front, there is a subliminal kill and sex on the, um, the picture of him, and we're being subliminally affected by this all the time. Interestingly, we, we, we talked about in the Iraq uh, invasion about embedded reporters, embedded with the, um, 
with the troops. So, of course, they tell the official story and don't get independent. That's why so many independent journalists got killed in the Iraqi conflict, because they don't want independent journalists. They want embedded reporters. Interestingly, what do they call in the advertising industry these subliminal implants and advertisements? They call them embeds. And that's what the reporters were, embedded subliminal uh, reporters who appeared to be telling the truth of the war while they were only giving the official version of events because they were so beholding to the uh, troops for their own lives. Subliminals. You notice how many times you'll see Blair or Bush and people when they're talking to um, soldiers or they're talking to a crowd, they have the crowd or the soldiers behind them. Well, I thought they're supposed to be talking to them, ignorant buggers. No, they want them behind them because the picture is subliminal. Literally, it's saying the troops are behind me, the troops are with me. Um, and they pick up uh, uh, children, subliminal. Hey, look, you know, we've saved the children of Iraq when we've killed thousands and thousands and thousands of them. But the subliminal is designed to avoid that. Of course, George Bush has to go too far, you know what I mean? It's like he can't work it out. But that's why they do it. It's all subliminal. It's all spin. It's not about what's true. It's what they can get us to believe. Subliminal photographs, which give a certain image, and we decode them in that way. There's, look at that. See the sex now? Because the subliminal has been brought to the conscious mind. Therefore, we see it. And that's why this information is so important, because it's bringing the, what's remained hidden to the conscious mind, and people can see it now. And uh, we decode a different reality. So what we're doing, and what they want us to do, is comb the mirror. They want us to think that the answers are out there, when there is no out there, there is only an in here. And they don't want us to go within to change what we project without in reality, they want us to comb the mirror. If you stand in front of a mirror and you want to comb your hair, you don't comb the bloody mirror, you comb your hair and the mirror reflects it. What, when we change ourselves, our sense of reality, then we change what we project and therefore we change what the mirror um, uh, reflects. And this is the, the, the knowledge that they don't want us to have, that we are um, reflections of ourselves. Our reality reflects our sense of reality. So when we um, are in a state of fear, we attract what we fear because we are manifesting that reality by creating it. And we become prisoners of the matrix. When we project love, we receive love in our experience because one is manifesting the other. Infinite love is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. Now, when I'm talking... When I'm talking about oneness and the uh, connection of everything, when I came to Mount Shasta, um, I heard a wonderful poem by, uh, by Grace... Um, Shalimar's partner, who is a true lady of the mountain. And it was such a beautiful poem about oneness that I asked her to come along today and, and read it. Are you around, Grace, uh, my dear? Are you there? Are you going to come on here, are you? Oh, here she is. Hello, my darling. There we go. All yours, my dear. In the darkness, alone, before the dawn breaks silver, the black sky, I awoke, restless. A vastness of consciousness pulls me from slumber, pulls me awake from the other side of illusion. And I want to go there, to touch that, to be touched completely to the core, to widen out like a desert horizon stretching forever into emptiness. Consciousness alone exists, and all this that appears to be real is but its play. All worlds, all forms, all thoughts and perceptions of reality are but vaporous creations of some holy, mysterious chemistry, appearing, disappearing rising, falling, like waves of the sea, breaking upon the shores of mind. How poignantly precious that you imagine you exist, dreaming worlds into being through a dream of time. 
nectarous secretions dripping dew-like in the secret folds of your flesh shape perceptions of reality wherein you exist. For a moment, for an hour, for a lifetime, you appear to exist. And the dreamer dreams itself into myriads of worlds. Myriads of worlds and plays and stories, all for the space of a moment's dreaming, all for the play of eternal being. There will come a time when you will realize you do not exist at all, apart from the dreamer beyond all these dreams. But a million worlds may come and go, a million waves rise and fall, before that realization dawns softly upon your mind, and you melt back into the vast sea. Until then, you will taste so fully all that you long to taste, both bitter and sweet, laughing behind your tears, smiling behind your sorrows, fearless beyond your fears, secretly untouched and untarnished by whatever appears. Birthless, deathless, beginningless, endless, this appearance of you does not exist but as a fleeting dream in the mind of the one who is. Thank you. Thank you. What a going on actually from what Grace has said what this uh, voice in Brazil said you can hear me was uh, basically we had created this matrix by becoming disconnected not literally but a sense of disconnection from the whole and therefore we had forgot that the dream and the dreamer were the same and we got caught in the dream and uh, Neil Haig um, symbolizes this in a series of uh, pictures which are in this uh, new book of how we created by a sense of reality and disconnection, a sense of disconnection, not a literal one. We're already home, we've just forgotten. And through fear, symbolized by the figure, we created this matrix of uh, a dream world which then controlled us and took control of us. And uh, we have created the matrix through a sense of division. And months after I um, heard the voice tell me this in Brazil, I came across this Hindu myth which says, human consciousness began as a ripple that decided to leave the ocean of consciousness, the timeless, spaceless and eternal. When it awakened to itself in this, quote, disconnected state, it forgot that it was part of the infinite ocean and felt isolated and separated. And that appears to be uh, the, the foundation of uh, what has happened, a sense of disconnection has ca- created a reality of disconnection. And in so many ways, fundamental ways, the Illuminati and the reptilian manipulation and all this is actually just a reflection of us. It's just an, a reflection of us. It's part of us that we have created. It's no good saying we are one and then saying the reptilians are this and we're something else. They are an expression of us. And we can um, only deal with this by removing the sense of disconnection and therefore removing the disconnected manifestation, going from division, uh, which has created the matrix, into um, oneness. And um, what is happening now is these eggshells that the uh, society has manipulated us into are starting to crack. There is some kind of vibrational alarm clock which I was told about a long time ago, indeed the ancients have talked about, um, which is now starting to wake people up and they're starting to see beyond this five sense uh, reality. They're going beyond the vibrational prison and starting to bring um, that 
sense of reality into this world, from division to oneness. And seeing beyond the illusion. Symbolically, again, in the Matrix movie, it was when the Neo character, of course, rearranged the, the, the letters and you get one, was when he died... He was shot, and of course his reality was still that when you get shot, you die, and he died. Trinity, symbolizing love, told him to wake up, wake up, I love you. And when he woke up from apparent death and overcame the biggest illusion of all, death doesn't exist, but the fear of it is a massive form of control, in fact the biggest, suddenly he wasn't seeing Um, the physical world anymore, the agents. He was seeing the reality of the matrix. He was seeing beyond it. And uh, we're in a time now where we just need to free our mind, free ourselves from the program which is constantly telling us to see reality in a certain way. And we're going through this process. Um, I say we're going through this process. I'm always going through the bugger I am. I am, I'm glad, you know. I think, oh no, I'm through this now, oh, we'll have some of that, darling, you know what I mean? And, you know, I'm not sitting cross-legged on a mountain going like this, I'm going through bloody hell a lot of the time, you know what I mean? Um, that's why I'm going to give the big one a smack when I get out of here, you know? <laughs> symbolically, symbolically, you are a slave, Neo, first stage. Realize the situation we're in. We're in this imprisoned situation and understanding why. You then choose freedom and not giving in and acquiescing to the imposition. And then you see your reality fall a frickin' pie. (laughs) Ah! A few years, a few years, not more, less than that, into this awakening, I thought, if this is spirituality, you can stuff it. This is no fun. Why? Because, because um, when we choose freedom, that's what we have to do, and it triggers it, and we choose it. We don't play lip service to it. Then we start accessing these other levels, and we start getting restructured in terms of our reality, and and our lives change. And in the transformation process, it can be a bit challenging. And what tends to happen with a lot of people is they say, I want to create my own reality knowingly, and I want to be spiritual. And what they think is, what happens now is I go down lovely leafy lanes, and there, there are nymphs and butterflies that drop on my shoulder. Because uh, I'm spiritual now. <laughs> and, and, and all freaking hell breaks loose. And you think, what have I done wrong here? You know what I mean? And, 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 and people go, uh, what they, they put out this intent, yes, I want freedom. And then what they need to do to, to reach that sense of freedom and infinite oneness, breaking down the barriers that we throw up and are thrown up between us, it's that what we need to do comes towards us now and, and they go, ooh, I'd like to be free and I'd like to transform, but not that badly. I'm off, thank you very much. <laughs> what sounds Wheel of Fortune on, honey? <laughs> But if you stick with it, then your life starts to transform. It becomes an amazing synchronistic um, series of coincidences that lead us through the path that not we're being guided through, really, that we are creating. Know thyself. Thyself. We are not our thoughts. We are not our emotions. We are not our personality. We are the silence between them that they so desperately wanted to keep us from. And you know what's interesting? When... um, uh, uh, Credo through the bones and uh, was incredibly accurate. We went on a radio uh, interview together, Canadian station, um, uh, newsforthesoul.com, really good, uh, with Nicole. And we were talking about the way through the bones. And, and she said to him, how do you do that? How do you get the bones, to, how do you get them to tell you these things? And he said, well, I don't really know, but all I can say is when I throw the bones, I go into the silent cave which is just like I say, the silence between the thoughts. Different, slightly different language only, same thing. He said, and when I go into the silent cave, the state of consciousness, past, present and future all meet at the same point. And he said, at that point, the bones talk to me. 
and they tell me and I pass it on. And again, wherever you go in the world, you know this fragmented knowledge I was talking about that has, that has somehow survived through the ages of the attempts to suppress it completely. They all talk about the silent place. And um, when we go into states of meditation, I don't meditate, but I, I, I daydream a lot, which is basically the same thing, I guess. And you go into the silent place. And you know the reason it's silent? It's because it all, it's all knowing. It doesn't have to work things out. <laughs> At the level of the computer. It is all knowing. It just knows. It doesn't have to work things out. It knows. You go into those states, you just know. You don't know why you know. You don't have to know why you know. You don't have to articulate why you know. You just know. Because you are in the place of all knowingness, all possibility, all love, all um, wisdom, all everything. Don't think you are, know you are. That, that, that is so important and it's exactly what I'm talking about. We get caught in the place of thinking. The program. We need to connect to the place of knowing and then we'll control the program and make the program work for us and not, the pro and not us work for the program. We will live life instead of life living us. Yeah. It's like, <clears throat> stop trying to hit me and just hit me. We're always in the process of trying to do something, so we're also in, always in the process of trying to do it. We don't actually get there because we're always in the process of trying to do it. And this, um, this voice in Brazil said to me, don't ask the question, know the answer. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's paraphrasing or, 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 or slightly changing that line in the Matrix movie. It said, um, it's not the question that drives you mad. It is asking it. Know it. We know when we go to the place of silence between the thoughts and you become the one. He's the one. No, we're all the one. From division to oneness. And this 100th monkey syndrome, the more that people awaken, what can I do? Just awaken. Know thyself. Be thyself. Be what you are. And you will put that into the human matrix. And the human matrix will manifest a new collective reality that will bring the house of cards down. I love that one. Big Brother is watching you. I, I love Daffy Duck. I think he's great. But, you know, it's like, again, you know, you, we, we need to be in awareness of what's going on, but we don't have to be in fear of it. People say to me, oh, are you frightened of what you're doing? And I understand the question. Aren't you frightened? And aren't you afraid of your, of, of, of your life and all that stuff? No. No, no. Two things. One, um, the worst thing that can happen to me is I leave this illusion and go to... Um, the reality of love. I'm terrified, do you know what I mean? I'm going to put it off as long as I can. So that's the worst thing that can happen. And the other thing is, we don't create our own reality when there's an R in the month and the, you know, it's a Tuesday. We create our reality all the time. And therefore, the only place that anyone can harm me or stop me is in here. I won't let it in. Sorry, can't manifest. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the, this is the truth they don't want us to know. When I first came to America in 96 to talk about this stuff, I, um, I was here for three months, I talked to no bugger. Uh, you're looking at a man who, who spoke in Chicago to eight people. Right. I did a workshop, two turned up. I really did well. Uh, but um, but uh, what I did is I met a lot of whistleblowers over that three months. It cost me a bloody fortune because I spent my own money uh, most of the time. And um, what happened was um, a very clear... Uh, sequence was clear after a few weeks and massively clear after a few months. Those whistleblowers who were doing it in fear of the consequences were getting the consequences. Those who were wearing the consequences like a war medal were getting the consequences. Those who were just doing it without fear of the consequences were not getting the consequences on, uh, in, in, the, in the same way. Uh, because we create our own reality and all the time. Therefore, we are in control. They're just trying to kill us. We're not. 
So what Martin Luther King said was the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in, at times of challenge and controversy. These are times of challenge and controversy, but they're wonderful, wonderful times to be in this reality, to see and experience this glorious transformation from fear to love, from prison, fear to paradise, love. And he also said, cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it politic? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience asked the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. This is the moment we're at. So, break out the eggshell, open the heart, love on a cosmic, infinite level, and we will transform the house of cards. That's the way, we don't have to stockpile weapons, we don't have to hang Henry Kissinger, we don't have to hate George Bush or hate reptilians or anything, because we are them and they are us, they are in just different points of observation of reality. Um, and when we do that, we will uh, bring this house of cards down, this structure of control, and people say, well, how will we structure society? Uh, you know, we don't have to structure society. Change of consciousness manifests itself. Therefore, change consciousness to love. We will live in a society that runs with love. Build a society from a manifestation of fear. We will live in a society based on division and fear and will be run and controlled in structures that reflect that fear. We don't have to work it out and sit round tables. What about the, what kind of, um, who's going to run this and who's going to, uh, love, everything will manifest based on love.